Hi guys, welcome back to She Smiles at the Future. I am here to do another installment for my Catholic Chronicles by Keith Green. I'm on number three. Um, it's been a little while since I've been able to do this. Since I did number two, I'm sorry about that. Life has gotten the best of me lately, but I'm here now, finally. Um, let's see how this goes. I'm going to give it a shot and see what life brings as I'm doing this. Um, I, I am happy to welcome anybody new here. I'm Amanda. Um... I hope you guys are enjoying my content. Um, I pray that this is speaking to somebody. I pray that this is helping somebody out there. Um, and if you haven't watched number one and two of this series, um, I highly recommend you go and, and check those out. Um, they were very f packed full of facts um and very interesting um realities of what what the catholic church believes the first one was about covering the eucharist the second one was covering the mass today with Catholic Chronicles number three, I'm going to be covering, this one is going to be covering um, Salvation According to Rome is the title of this third installment of Keith Green's Catholic Chronicles. So let's, without further ado, let me just start reading it because that's what I do. I read it and... Um, Add in my two cents whenever I feel led to. And usually by the, you know, after reading it, I kind of give my insights on it too. Um, and that's pretty much it. So without further ado, let me get into this. I'm holding my phone, so that's why I'm sorry if I'm like moving around here. Okay. I look like I'm, this is supposed to be like a, you know, kind of like a Rome looking background. <laughs> okay, guys. It starts out by sharing Romans 6.23. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. How blessed is it to know Jesus? His love, his mercy, his righteousness, his forgiveness. He has promised to cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea, Micah 7, 19. And to separate us from our sins as far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103, 12. This is the good news. That, that's the literal meaning of the word gospel, good news. That is what the true church of our God has the privilege of proclaiming. Liberty to the captives. Luke 4.18. The reason I begin this article on the Roman Catholic view of salvation with such rejoicing in my Savior is because I have just finished reading a mountain of official Roman church literature on the subject. And I can honestly say I have never had such joy. Sorry, I'm, I printed this out this time. That's why I'm reading it from a paper. In my heart of hearts about the finished work of Christ. As I scoured each page of and read of penance, confession, venial and mortal sins, indulgences, purgatory, etc., I then had the infinite pleasure of searching the scriptures to see what they had to say on these fundamental Catholic doctrines. Oh, what relief my soul found in the scriptures. Oh, what holy joy, what clarity of light I saw as the simple brilliance of God's mercy shone into my mind. If there is anything more beautiful than God's love and patience with man, it has never been revealed to mortals. 
All this to say that I am bogged down with the information I have accumulated and I will probably have to cover it all in this, Chronicle number three. Briefly touching on each subject while always coming back to the main question, according to Rome, how can a man or a woman be saved from the consequences of his sinful nature and actions and how can they gain assurance that they are in a right standing before God? The Catholic teaching on sin. Before we can understand what Catholics are taught about salvation, we must first see what they are taught they need to be saved from. In Matthew 1, the angel of the Lord speaks to Joseph in a dream about his betrothed, Mary, saying, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. That's um, verse 21 from Matthew 1. Today, many evangelicals toss around the term saved without much thought. When did you get saved, someone might ask. It's almost like a title or a badge that a person wears to prove that he's become part of the club, the saved club. Others are under the impression that when a person talks of being saved, they are talking about being saved from many different things, sickness, death, and the devil, hell, etc. But when the angel of the Lord used that precious word to prophesy that Jesus would fulfill all the predictions of the prophets, he made it very clear that what Jesus was coming to save his people from were their sins. In official Roman Catholic theology, this too is the main thing that people are taught they need to be saved from, their sins. But the only thing that Catholic and evangel evangelical teachings have in common on the subject of sin is the spelling. For when a Catholic talks about his sins, you must find out first he is talking about mortal sins or venial sins. Which ones? Sorry, I have to switch hands. My arm's getting tired. And then you must ask him, how do you get rid of them? The answer given will likely confound a non-Catholic for words like faith, repentance, even Jesus will usually be missing in the answer. Instead, a whole new list of other words will have to be learned, defined, and understood before the evangelical can fully... Oh, I'm sorry, wrong page, guys. <laughs> Hold on to that thought. These are all messed, mixed up, guys. I'm sorry. Okay, here we are. Before the evangelical can fully grasp how a Catholic has taught his sins and the penalty due them can be canceled out. Mortal and venial sins. The first of these unfamiliar words are the names of two groups Rome has separated all sins into. Now, if you're Catholic, you might be wondering why I'm making such a big deal for the dividing of sins into two distinct categories, each with their own set of consequences and remedies, has been part of the Catholic doctrine for a long, long time. According to Rome's definition, mortal sin is described as any great offense against the law of God and is so named because it is deadly, killing the soul and subjecting it to eternal punishment. Venial sins, on the other hand, are small and pardonable offenses against God and our neighbor, unlike mortal sins. Venial sins, I think you meant venial, but they did a misprint there, are not thought to damn a soul to hell, but with the committing of each venial sin, a person increases his need for a longer stay in the purifying fires of a place called purgatory. Look that word up in your Bible dictionary you'll find it right next to venial. Yeah. Now there is no agreement among the priests as to which sins are mortal and which are venial, but there are, but they all proceed on the assumption that such a distinction does exist. The method of classification is purely arbitrary. What is venial according to one may be mortal according to another. According to Rome, the Pope is infallible in matters of faith and doctrine. He should then be able to settle this important matter by accurately catalog cataloging those sins which are mortal as distinguished from those which are venial. However, there are some def definites in the mortal category blatantly breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Practically all sexual offenses, whether in word or thought or deed, and a long list of transgressions which have changed throughout the centuries. For instance... Until Vatican II, it was a mortal sin to attend a Protestant church, to own or read a Protestant Bible, or to eat meat on Friday. Oh, and it's still a mortal sin to miss Mass on Sunday morning, 
without a good excuse, excuse, which means that considerably more than half of the claimed Roman Catholic membership throughout the world is constantly in mortal sin. Venial sins include things like thinking bad thoughts, having wrong motives, losing your temper, etc. Things that do not necessarily lead into an actual sin, but still nevertheless are sins that need to be eradicated in some way. What does the Bible say? The Bible makes no distinction between mortal and venial sins. There is in fact no such thing as a venial sin. All sin is mortal. It is true that some sin are worse than others, but it is also true that all sin is not forgiven bring death to all sins that are not forgiven bring death to our soul. The Bible simply says the wages of sin is death. That's Romans 6, 23. And Ezekiel says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. 18, 4. James says that whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, has he has become guilty of all. That's James 2.10. He meant not that the person who commits one sin is guilty of all kinds of sin, but that even one sin unatoned for shuts a person completely out of heaven and subjects him to punishment, just as surely as one misstep by the mountain climber plunges him into destruction into can and into a canyon below. We know how quick human nature is to grasp at any excuse for sin. Rome seems to be saying these sins are really bad, but those, well, you can get away with a few of them and not really suffer too much. Speaking of getting away with something, let's get right down how to, into how Rome teaches you how to get rid of your sins. Confession. The Catholic system starts to get real complicated when we begin to look at the ways one can erase both their mortal and venial sins. Two kinds of punishments are due to mortal sin. Eternal, that's in hell forever. And temporal, that's in purgatory. Eternal punishment is canceled by either baptism or confession to a priest. The Baltimore Catechism defines confession as follows. Confession is the telling of our sins to be authorized priest for the purpose of attaining forgiveness. The important words here are authorized priest. And to be genuine, a confession must be heard, judged, and followed by obedience to the authorized priest as he assigns a penance, such as good works, prayers, fastings, abstinence from certain pleasures, etc. A penance may be defined as a punishment undergone in token of a repentance for sin, as assigned by the priest, usually a very light penalty. Let me find page five. I am sorry again, guys, for the confusion. <laughs> That's not page five. This is a long one, guys. I might, I might end up just doing half of this today because number three is long. Okay, guys, I found it. I am sorry. Okay. The New York Catechism says, I must tell my sins to the priest so that he will give me absolution. A person who knowingly keeps back a mortal sin in confession commits a dreadful sacrilege, and he must repeat his confession. Okay. Okay. So, so far he's covered that, again, this is all, this, this one is to do with the salvation, according to Rome. He's covered, there's different kinds of sins, the venial or the mortal. And depending on, you know, the sin, uh, yet, like he was saying, there's so much confusion within the church of even what is a venial, what is a mortal sin. And it's ch always changing, too. That's the other thing. Um, and then you have the issue of purgatory and hell, going to hell, you know, for to burn for forever in hell. Um, so... Yeah, and then you have the issue of, okay, 
what do you do with your sin? Well, you have to go talk to the priest in order to be forgiven of the sins. So he can give you the penance that you need to perform in order to get rid of this sin. Okay, that's what we've covered so far. The priest's role. Canon law 80, 888 says the priest has to remember that in hearing confession, he is a judge. And the book Instructions for Non-Catholics says a priest does not have to ask God to forgive your sins. The priest himself has the power to do so in Christ's name. Your sins are forgiven by the priest the same as if you knelt before Jesus Christ and told him, told them to Christ himself. Um, just wow, because you know what comes to my mind before I continue reading with that is when Jesus himself was in the temple and this, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, accused him of blasphemy, um, when he forgave somebody's sins. I believe it was when he healed um, the man that couldn't walk, the lame man. It was either the lame man or the blind man, but he was in the temple healing, and I believe it was on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, what's easier if I say to you, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk or, you know, I, so yeah, I, I think it was the lame man then. And when Jesus said that your sins are forgiven you, he was accused of, you know, blasphemy and, and everything else because he was claiming to be able to have the power and the authority to forgive sins which Jesus does have that power and authority because he's God. Um, and of course, that was, you know, getting closer to the time when Jesus was going to end up being crucified. And he knew that and he was starting to be more and more bold coming out as to who he really was and not holding back. And that... That's just what it makes me think of only because I thought of that only because these priests now in this, in the, in the Catholic church are taking that position of God there. We already know the Pope does, right? I mean, we already know the Pope claims to be, um, you know, God's mouthpiece, God's, um, He's in the, he's literally like, I'm trying to think of the right word to say this, but he's basically God on earth right now, you know, in, in place of God, he's like God on earth, you know, they call him the Holy Father. Um, so that, yeah, we know that the Pope claims these things. We know that he claims infallibility and, and all of these things, but the priests themselves and, and there's, you know, think of all the priests that there are in the, ch in the church all over the world. They also, the fact that they, they are, they have, they take the authority and the power to forgive sin. And like it just says, they don't even go. A priest does not ask God to forgive the sins. The priest himself has the power to do so in Christ's name. And of course, they would probably say, well, he's doing it in Christ's name. It doesn't matter. You don't have, nobody has the, the authority to forgive sin except for God himself. That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees freaked out when Jesus said that, because they knew that only God forgives sin. Um, of course, Jesus being God himself, it was fine, right? And they weren't, you know, they, they obviously weren't, oh, you know, um, 
got, they didn't have the eyes to see that. Their hearts were hardened to that reality, but that is the reality. And nobody else has that power and authority. Yet here we see these priests are taking this power and authority to forgive sin. Okay, I'm going to continue on. Um, the priest forgives the guilt of mortal sins, which save the penitent from going to hell. But he cannot remit the penalty due for those sins. And so the penitent must atone for them by performance and good works, which he prescribes. The penitent may be and usually is interrog interrogated by the priest so that he or she may make a full and proper confession. Stress is placed on the fact that any sin not confessed is not forgiven. Any mortal sin not confessed in detail is not forgiven. And that the omission of even one sin, mortal, may invalidate the whole confession. Every loyal Roman Catholic is required under pain of mortal sin to go to confession at least once a year, although monthly confession is said to be more satisfactory. But even after a penitent has received pardon, a large but unknown amount of punishment remains to be suffered in purgatory. The doctrine of purgatory rests on the assumption that while God forgives sin, he, his justice nevertheless demands that the sinner must suffer the full punishment due to him for his sin before he will be allowed to enter heaven. Okay, let me stop there for a second. Um, okay. I find this interesting. Um, another thing that just came to my mind as I was reading this. Um, think about this you know think about like here you are you're a priest you have these people that come to you and tell you all the nitty-gritty details of their life of their sin sinful thoughts or sins they are committing you know and and if you think about this this is this is kind of and i'm going to say that i mean it's very perverted because it's almost like being a voyeuristic, you know, a, um, you get to hear all of these really intimate details of somebody's thought life, you know, and because again, you know, the thoughts that you think if they're sexual or you know, whatever thoughts, you know, that, you, the, that you're having that are not, you know, that are sinful thoughts, you have to tell these, all of this, all of it, every detail to the, the priest. So it is, it's a very precarious thing, in my opinion. And to be a priest, to just sit there and listen to these people's most intimate, innermost thoughts is a bit, you know, it is, it's a, per, it's a perversion of what God, God didn't intend this like this. He didn't want us sitting there listening to each other's most detailed perverted thoughts. I, I just don't see that. Um, I, I, you know, and to me, I, I think it's a very, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous, um, situation because the person that's the priest is, is in this situation where he's hearing all of this and I don't know, guys. I, I just feel like it's, it's like, it's, 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 it's not good. It's not a good thing at all. You know, the priest himself has his own sin to deal with, right? <laughs> Never mind all of these other people's sins to deal with. That's why only God can deal with our sin. 
because God is God. God is not a man like us. God is God, you know, and only he can, can deal with our sin. So I just feel like our sin is so much just for us to deal with. My sin is, is a lot just for me to deal with. Never mind me taking on all these other people's sin and sitting and listening to all these people's sins, sinful thoughts or sinful acts that they're doing in their lives. That's not normal. That's, that's, we weren't made to do that because we're not God. <sighs> Sorry. It's just, it's, it blows my mind and it's upsetting because it, it's like, okay. And then we wonder why these priests, you know, I mean, there's so many, this is such a layered, um, why priests do what they do, right? Why priests, <laughs> why there's so many priests that have been caught in sexual perversions. Why there's so many priests that do, you know, abuse children, okay? Or take advantage of their power and, you know, with men or women or children, children, you know, you sit and wonder why. Well, this is part of the issue here. Look at this situation just with these priests hearing all these confessions, you know, and you don't think, you really don't think that these priests aren't telling other priests what they're hearing from the people in the confessional booths? Are you kidding me? Of course they do. Of course they go and tell and gossip and and talk about this one and talk about and this, this one did this and that one did this and that one did this. And this one has these thoughts and perversions and this one has those perversions. Come on now. And, and again, I'm not saying, you know, there's always true, genuine people that are trying to be genuine in, in any situation. So I'm not saying that all of the priests are like that, but I'm sorry. A lot of them are. And, and it's the, 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 the proof is in the pudding. All you got to do is look at the Catholic church through history and see the fruits of that. And you see bad fruit, sorry, rotten fruit. Okay. On the whole, on the whole, I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of good people in there trying to be genuine and sincere and truly helping people. And they're just under this deception that this is the way that we're supposed to be doing things. I, okay. But when you really break this down and you look at this whole system of how they're doing this, it's sick. It's just so wrong. I mean, I even think even, you know, I'm a mother of six children. Okay. And honestly, if I, if, even if I say I, it's almost like I can equivalate it in my mind, you know, like if I had each of my children coming to me once a month and they had to tell me all of the sinful thoughts they've had, they've had to sit and tell me all the sins that they've done all month and every sinful thought they've thought, I wouldn't want to hear all that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to because here's the thing. I do believe there are certain sins that we do need to confess to one another. Okay. I'm not saying that. I think that there are certain things we should be confessing to one another and we should be telling one another, like in, you know, keeping each other um, in check and, and being, you know, accountable for another one another is definitely biblical. But not to this level where it's like, okay, today I had this perverted thought, uh, okay, about this person. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't want to know these things. 
again, I'm not God. You need to take that to the Lord. That's the, you need to go confess that to the Lord. You need to go get, get that right with God. Repent and ask for forgiveness from your creator. He already knows you have those thoughts anyway. So, you know what I mean? God knows what we're thinking. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. Oh, Lord. Okay. Where did I leave off? There's my tangent for you guys. Like I said, I'm not going to do this whole thing today. I'm already at 30 minutes. So I'm not going to drag this on. I'm not going to make this a really super long one. So I'm going to finish up here soon. Technically, venial sins um, need to be confessed since they are comparatively light and can be canceled by good works, prayers, extreme unction. That's the other thing. They're, they're basically teaching that, you know, so you're forgiven for your sins by performing these acts and these good works. That's not how it works. We're forgiven for our sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's why we're forgiven for our sins. We repent. We ask God for forgiveness. But us performing some kind of thing here, duty or something, isn't what is giving us the forgiveness. What's giving us the forgiveness is his sacrifice. But the terms are quite elastic and permit considerable leeway on the part of the priest. It is generally advised that it is safer to confess supposed venial sins. Also, since the priest alone is able to judge accurately which are mortal and which are mortal. I'm sorry, and which are venial. The Baltimore Catechism says, when we have committed no mortal sins since our last confession, we should confess our venial sins. Or some sin told in a previous confession uh, for which we can, again, say we're sorry in order for the priest to give us absolution. What chance has a poor sinner against such a system as that? As an example, a minister friend of mine who was brought up in the Catholic Church tells a story of how his older brother went to confession every single week, confessed the same sin to the same priest, and was given the same penance in order to receive... Um, absolution this went on a week after week year after year and one day while on a trip from home he decided that he would not break his pattern of going to weekly confession so he went to another catholic church in the city he was visiting he went into the confessional box and confessed the same sin to a different priest he began with father forgive me for i have sinned and then they began confessing the sin once again but this time he was shocked when the priest said but my son that is not a sin my friend's brother got up and hurried out the door, and from that day he um, on, he has never stepped into another church again. <sighs> okay. We, historical development. We search in vain in the Bible for any word supporting the doctrine of Ari Ari Circ Ariocolo. This is a weird word I have never seen in my life. Aracular <laughs> confession. Something confession, guys. I'll put it up here when I edit this. It's A U R I C U L A R. I don't even want to try to say that word, okay? It is equally impossible to find any authorization or general practice of it during the first 1,000 years of the Christian era. No, not a word is found in the writings of the early church fathers about confessing sins to a priest or anyone except God alone. There's that word again. Confession is not mentioned once in the writings of Augustine, Oregon, 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 Nestrotus, Tetrotullin, Jerome, uh, or Anthentheus. All of these and many other apparently lived and died without ever thinking of going to a confession. No one other than God was thought to be worthy to hear these confessions or to grant forgiveness. Amen. Hello. 
Confession was first introduced into the church on a voluntary basis in the 5th century by the authority of Leo the Great, but it was not until the 4th Lateran Council in 1215 under Pope Innocent III that private auricularal, that word again, confession, <laughs> was made compulsory. And all Roman Catholic people were re required to confess and seek absolution. Yeah. From a priest at least, at least once a year, if they did not obey this command, they were pronounced guilty of mortal sin and damned to an eternity in hell. Wow. Wowzers, wowzers, wowzers. You know, and in the in the dark ages, right? In the Middle Ages, here's the thing. They had a, a I'm sorry to say this, but they had an excuse as to why they Okay, guys, sorry. I had to stop recording and deal with life. So I'm back. Actually, I don't need this in. Um, uh, let me just finish up here. I needed to just wrap this up. I was saying that in the dark ages, and let me, let me see. It's like a few hours later in real time. So let me like, let me like get back to this thought I had on this. In the dark ages, middle ages, when they started to enforce this thing, this, this confession, like it said with, um, Pope Innocent the third that, and again, I don't know how to say this word. You know what? Let me look. This okay, guys. Up. So the word is auricular. Okay. Um, that just, yeah. Anyway, I had to like, look it up and, and listen to somebody say it. There it is. It's auricular. Okay. But like I said, the fourth Lateran council in 1215 under Pope Innocent III, that private, that private auricular confession was made compulsory, compulsory. Okay. That's when they first started to enforce this confession with the priest and so on and so forth. What I was saying, the point I wanted to make was that at least back then, during the Dark Ages, during the Middle Ages, those people had the excuse of they, a lot of those people didn't read, number one. They they weren't um, literate. And number two, they didn't even allow them to read the Bible and the Bible was only for the priests to read in Latin. So they didn't even understand what was being said when the Bible was being read to them. They only could go off of what the priest was telling them. So they were completely ignorant of all of this. They, they had no idea what the Bible actually said. Today, people in the world don't really have that excuse, especially here in the West, where there are Bibles all over the place, and you can get your hands on a Bible and read for yourself in the Word of God you know, some of the scriptures that Keith Green shared already and, you know, how it's, you know, states in the word of God that we don't need to go to a man to confess our sins. So that's the point I wanted to make is that when they first started to institute this, this practice of going into a confessional booth and, you know, confessing to the priest, they were, it was during a time in history when they could really get away with it. In other words, the people were ignorant 
in a lot of cases of what the Bible actually says. Now, today, you people don't have that. We are not ignorant. We can open the Bible. We can read the Bible and for ourselves. So I guess that's just the point I wanted to make. I am going to stop right there um, with this today. And when we continue on um, for the next session, which would be part two of Catholic Chronicles 3, we're going to you know, pick up and he's going to start getting into, um, can a priest forgive sins, right? He's going to get into that. He's going to get into the penance. He's going to get into penance as a system of works. And um, he's going to get into... Eight, nine. Um, then he gets, and then he gets into the conclusion. My, sorry about my daughter. She's just into the conclusion, and okay. And then he kind of gets into um, just our assurance of salvation, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this, you know, I wanted to just end it there and just say that. Stop it, Ro. <laughs> stop. I just wanted to say thanks for listening. I hope that you guys, um, <laughs> Aurora, stop. I'm sorry. Uh, this is why, you know, I have a hard time making these videos because I've got <laughs> silly pants over here to contend with. Okay. But anyway, that's it guys. I hope you enjoyed this, this, um, this, <laughs> I feel like we're what is this, the hunchback of Notre Dame over here? Okay. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this this video. And like I said, guys, next time we will do part two. And always remember, Ro. Oh, gosh. Always remember. Ro, what do I always say at the end of my video? Um, no, I'll, what I always say is. No matter what we're going through, right? <laughs> no matter what life throws at us or how crazy the world gets, oh, <laughs> we always have a reason to smile. Why do we always have a reason to smile, Ro? Because God's with us. That's right. Very good. Because, because of Jesus. So, guys, no matter what the future holds, <laughs> with Jesus, we always have a reason to smile. Smile, Ro. <laughs> smile. Smile. And go like this. God bless. <laughs> Guys, she's six years old. I don't know what to say. Until next time, God bless.